Hello, and welcome to the You're an Asset podcast. I'm your host, Casey the Dollar. And on this podcast, we find out who is an asset in the financial industry and who is just an ass. It is. The BMIs are stupid. Today's episode is going to be very special. We are allowing for viewers, listeners, fans, clients, potential clients, come to the show, come get your questions answered. We're basically doing a live Q&A on today's episode of the You're an Asset podcast. So let's get started. Awesome. Well, Dustin is calling in here with uh, some questions about stuff and things. So amazing. Let Dustin bring him in. Dustin. Dustin. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> What's going on, my friend? Oh, same old same. I, uh, I'm glad that you're doing this call. I've been thinking about doing it myself, and I have not. So I'm glad that you put the foot forward. I'm just too lazy to do this. Yeah, 100%. What are you, what are you doing today that you're just chilling, hanging out? Uh, it's every huh? day. So I'm, I'm really like full marketing right now. Since I opened my company okay. and hired about 26 advisors, now I'm just mm-hmm. behind the mic all day long. So you, you need to find some time to do live Q&As then, huh? I do. Yeah. I know. I took my daughter's phone away permanently, so I get her phone. So now I can live stream on TikTok and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, poor girl. She's probably very upset. Yeah. You know, you said like you get the question all the time of like, why is an IUL better than, better than everything? But Dustin, why is an IUL better than everything? <laughs> two, there's two answers. Two answers is it's not. And then the other answer is it is. Yeah. If that makes any sense, where it is better is that you have the ability to grow cash value without being in the market. You're Mm -hmm. mirroring the market, but you're not in the market. So Mm -hmm. that is where it's better than everything else. The problem Mm -hmm. is in 2024, we have this unrealistic expectation of crypto returns, 10, 50, 100, 300% returns in one year. Yeah. So if that's what you're looking for, the IUL isn't any good. But if you're like, hey, I want part of my portfolio to grow with the market with no chance of loss from the market. So I'll talk about that. You can lose money in the IUL, especially if it's not set up correctly. If you set up a policy that's not finely tuned 7702 or close to it, the fees will slowly eat into the policy later on down the road if you have a 0% return. So let's say you have a million dollars in your account, your fees that year are $10,000 and there's no growth, your account will drop by $10,000. So, and that scares a lot of people away, but I'm up front with everything. And I'm telling you that as far as the first 20 years go, your no lapse premium doesn't really move. So your costs don't really move. In the first 20 years, if you have zero years, you won't lose value. Anyways, I say all that to say you have the latter effect. So if anyone knows anything about securities, the S&P 500, there's 25% growth years, and then there's negative 40%, and then negative five, and then zeros, and then 12. That is what we call, I guess you call it an EKG, and it makes your heart do that. It's like, oh, it's up, yay. Oh, lost it, no. So why would you want to do that? Why would you want to guess when you can average about 7% tax-free in the S&P 500 using indexed universal life? So that's the reason why I like it. They say, you know, if you're in the S&P 500 for the last uh, 30 years, you could average 9%. What they don't tell you is you take that 9%, you minus, let's say you're lucky and you have a 1% fee, uh, managed fee. So now you're averaging 8%. And then if you take taxes away, another 2%, technically you average 6%. Mm-hmm. So let's put the money in post-tax, earn seven with no fees or about 50 basis points over a lifetime. You're actually mm-hmm. doing better in the cash value life insurance, plus you have living benefits. If you're in Washington and you have a long-term care rider, That satisfies your long-term care issues. There's so many different things that the IUL can do. The negative is me, Casey, and like five other people that I know do this. Everyone else, (laughs) they set them up with fat targets, fat death benefits. Some lady messaged me the other day and said, I wanted to do $70 a month. And this agent from this three-letter agency wrote me a $400,000 death benefit IUL. It's like, for one, how on earth did they do that? Because... 
That doesn't even seem like it's meeting the minimum. No, yeah. not even close. So they, they did something in there, but there's just so many evil people out there that are just, how can I make money off of this person? And I know we talked about that in the first podcast. Did you see that there's all these insurance forums like on Facebook and whatnot, and something happened with WFG lately? Did you see this? Oh, I know all about it. And I knew about it about three months ago because the guy who's pushing it so much, I've been in his DMs for months telling him, you know, you're capped at 55% commissions and that this carrier you keep using actually gives 155% commission. So in other words, WFG is overriding you 100%. No, that's not how it works. not how it works. Is this Eric Olson? No, Eric, I don't really personally know. It's Money Mythbusters, Matt uh, Schloss. Oh. I've talked to him for hours, hours about commission uh, schedules, bonuses, like bonuses aren't free, that bonuses come from overrides. The only way WFG can pay out bonuses is if they override you and then give some of it back. That's like two weeks before he went ahead and said, we're going to leave and we're going to go to GFI, I believe it is. We're going to set up GFI. GFI. He said, uh, hey, you know, we thought about what you talked about and we're, we're leaving WFG. I was like, I think after reading the documents, there's a lot more to it than people know. And I think this is going to drag on for another year or so. What exactly is going to drag on? Because I don't know much. This is how far away I am from all of this crap. And I, and I just stay in my bubble. I don't know. <laughs> all I know is that there's some guy named Eric Olson, WFG. He decided to talk about how they're getting screwed over there. I didn't realize that that all related back to Money Mythbuster. Yeah, he's uh, he's like the top five producers under Eric Olson. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to get in trouble, but he's like the cult leader and everybody else is kind of the minions. <laughs> and uh, so that Eric Olson was making a million dollars a month of overrides. That's everybody knows him because he's just making tons of money. He That's found insane. out years and years and years later that he didn't own his own business. The fact that he was there that long and he was getting paid these overrides, he should have known that, but he came out and said, Hey, I don't own my business. I didn't know that. So I'm going to lose a million dollars of overrides to go start my own thing. The devil in the details is months before he even talked about this, he was recruiting people within WFG saying, Hey, I'm about to leave. Do you want to come with me? And that's completely against his contract. So the reason why he's getting countersued is he was trying to recruit people to his place before he even left. Is he the guy that started this GFI? Place? Yeah. Eric Olson. He's the GFI leader. Got it. Got it. I mean, he's been in the business for a while. He's a big name. But, like, he seems like he's do doing things right. Like, I have no problem with him. I'm not planning to call him out on anything other than, like, what's going on with the recruiting? Are you training people to do the right thing or what's up? There's only two things I have wrong, uh, an issue with Matt is he writes a lot of volatility control indexes, which you just talked about. And then two is he writes a lot of bonus annuities. Because he's kind of dangling the carrot in front of your face. If you know anything about bonus annuities, whoever's listening, a bonus annuity actually came out to get you out of a crappy annuity or something with a surrender charge. He says, oh, you have a million dollars in the old 401k. What if I could get you $100,000 tomorrow? Oh, that's great. Here you go. Sign the dotted line. But what they don't tell you is, let's say your annuity has a 5% spread. So the S&P goes up 25%. You get 20 because they spread 5%. They take 5% for yeah. themselves. That They have to make money somehow. Now your spread may be 9%. So it's a bigger spread because insurance companies, they're not dumb. They're the best in the world at controlling the controllables. So if they know, hey, Casey rolls over a million dollars in her lifetime or in the next 10 years, let's say, at most, we're going to give her $700,000 of credited interest at the most. So if we give her 100 up front, we can only allow her to make 600 for the rest of the year. So that's how they spread the caps or okay. lower the caps spread. They know so much is going to go to you. So the bonus is just coming off the back end. 100%. I, I literally show people the bonus and then the not bonus because everyone's heard about, well, can't you get some bonus for rolling over your money or whatever? And then you show them the product without the bonus and they go, well, this one is better. And it's crazy because even the projections of the cash value are better. No yeah. bonus. And it looks better. And people are like, oh, I'm confused. Why? Like, I mean, you have to think about it from just a contractual standpoint. If you sign a 10-year contract to roll over money, the day you give them the money, they're going to take your million dollars and they're going to spend it. They're going to go make more money on your money. So the reason why they have a contract period is if you come in five years later and you're like, hey, I need all my money back, they're going to charge you an 8 7 10% fee because now they have to go liquidate some bonds, pay you back. 
So in that case, if they're giving you up front, even if it is on like little digits on paper saying we're going to give you 10 percent bonus, they're on the hook for 10 percent no matter what. So they're going to give you less on the back end. Their risk went up. So therefore, your risk went up. So so you're saying that he's selling a lot of annuity. How do you know that? Like, how do you know he's selling bonus? <laughs> uh, well, you seen one, it. Yeah. If you go back and watch his annuity videos, almost every time, if you look at the product name in the corner, it's some kind of bonus annuity. Oh. It's, it's sneaky though, right? Because you have to be really paying attention to that kind of stuff to catch. That's it. why I hate it is because other people aren't professionals. Whenever someone bait and switches you with, do you have a $180,000 bonus? That's what it is. I have a video that I want you to watch right now. And you tell me if you know this guy, if you've ever heard this name, you probably have heard the name and maybe Ryan can put this up on the, on the screen for, for everybody. Um, because this is a guy who's making millions as well. This guy who's making millions, uh, and he's speaking at some big convention. It is 95%, you know, sales and 5% product knowledge. And we get a lot of people coming in here and they're like, hey, I want to learn the product first. And they actually end up, you know, reading about it and, and looking it up and, you know, doing whatever they want to do, right? To take them like, you know, a couple of months before they even start. <laughs> I didn't know anything about it. Well. This industry is 95% sales and 5% product knowledge. I'll tell you, there's only one one instance that's true. If you come in and you know nothing, but you can talk me up and I make the correct sale, then it's 5% product knowledge, but you're going to learn it as you go. But what he is talking about is saying, know that there is an IUL for sale at Transamerica. Go talk to people and sell it. That's what he's saying. And this is an FFL guy. This guy works under Dan, playing with Dan. He's his number one guy. You know, this is, I'll tell you the slimiest story I've ever heard. And I'll just make it really quick. One of the guys that used to be part of the organization, his upline set up his IUL for him, for his sister, and for his mom. Kind of find out, mm -hmm. like, he was in the industry for a year before I talked to him, and he didn't know they were set up incorrectly. I, only being in the industry for six months, um, did a lot of product training, carrier training. Told him, I was like, that's wrong. It was $500,000 of death benefit level, and he was putting like $300 a month into it. Long story mm -hmm. short, he said, you know what? I wondered why whenever we wrote a policy, my boss would write the policy. He would receive, he would send the packets to himself, pull the illustration out and then send it to the client. So what he was doing is he said, okay, let's do a thousand dollars a month, $242,138 of death benefit option B in the app. He would switch it option a million dollars of death benefit, jack up the target. When he got pulled it out, you never knew. And this is what he did for thousands of policies over a year and a half at WFG. Holy sh That's the type of slime we're dealing with. It's so bad. Oh my god. Never even crossed my mind, but like it wow. Wow, wow, wow. How can we make this look better and make more money? That's that's all I hear. It's yep. insane. And I really wish I knew the guy's name because I now this this guy's name is Shoddy. Shoddy is a big have you heard that name before? Shoddy? I have yeah. from uh Corey. Like I have an agent now who's working, used to work with Shoddy and told him, you know, buy all these leads, yada, yada. They're, they're fresh leads. They're good leads. He submitted like six pieces of business. Every single one of them chargeback. Every single one of them. He's out like three, four grand in chargebacks to one of the carriers. The leads were not fresh leads whatsoever, but that's what they're telling people. Um, and they're telling them, this guy Shoddy is telling people, oh, like whatever they can do, just, just sign him up. For anything at all, get it done and just get it done. And then this video comes out of him. I just can't imagine that these are the people that are getting the microphone. Like these are the people that are getting the microphone, drawing the crowd, the whole deal. And the rest of us are just sitting here like, please like come to my live podcast and ask me questions. And then we're like, you know, and, and yeah, but because we're not doing something flashy and doing all the clickbait people are like, eh, boring. If I clickbaited, I could have easily made a million dollars a month. And then that's that's writing policies correctly. But too many people get greedy, like Ryan Rush. Too many people get get greedy. I have major regrets that I didn't call him out harder. I kind of wish you'd have called Depot out a little bit too, but it is what it is. He kept it very cool until we were offline. You know, the the adrenaline rush of like, okay, like we're gonna see what this is, and I don't want to purposely make people look bad. 
course, that's part of the show. But I mean, I, I need to be more conscious that people are going to try to fool me. And uh, it's tricky to be a social media person, too, and kind of like put yourself out there because people are watching. They're not just like they're not just talking to to tax free Mike. They're not just talking to me. They're not just talking to you. They're they're making their rounds. Some of these people and a lot of times they don't tell us that they're doing that. Well, I'll tell you, I had a conversation with my COO, COO yesterday. He has so much knowledge, product knowledge and industry knowledge. And I asked him, I was like, hey, I really I know my stuff. I know fixed indexed annuities. I understand indexing. I understand options, all that good stuff. I see so many of these Facebook groups where these people have been doing this for 15, 20, 25 years. And they say, if you put someone in an FIA under the age of 60, you're not doing right by the client. And he goes, wait, so someone's saying that a product doesn't make sense over managed money. And I said, yes. He goes, well, they must not be a fiduciary because that's not the case. It's Whatever the client wants is what they get. So it's kind of like a fine line. When you come to a CFA, CFP, if someone says, hey, I want an IUL because I see all these videos, you know, like, okay, here it is. No, I also want flexibility in it. No, I don't, I don't want to give you flexibility because it's going to underperform. We're not going to do that. Well, that's what I want. So, I mean, honestly, if you don't give it to me, I know the structure. I'm going to go to someone else. So then if you write it, the blood is not on your hands anymore. But since they said, okay, this is what I want. Go ahead and move forward. Well, I said all that to say that fixed index annuities, do they make sense for people under 60 years old? Or am I just, am I personally being taught wrong? Am I researching wrong to make more money? And he said, no. If, if someone says they want to track the S&P 500, they want no fees. They understand they can't touch it for 7, 10, 14 years, whatever it is. And they're okay with losing a little bit of the upside. Then they just, they told you exactly what they wanted. You have the fit, yeah. go put them in it. And I say all that to say, he said financial advisors and financial planners are taught that if someone says, I want this, you don't ask questions. So if they said, I want this policy, I don't care what the costs are, it looks good. And then they come back five minutes later and say, but what's the cost of insurance? Isn't there something on here? They technically don't have to say it because their fiduciary duty is to give you what you asked for in the first place. Completely wrong. You, you get it completely wrong, yeah. but that's what they do. I, you know, that my first annuities ever were for a 27 year old really? first annuities I ever did 27 year old. And I'll tell you what, this girl, she has much older parents. Okay. And she was just tripping about the stock market. She was like, I can't believe that I put this much money in the stock market already. She had a 401k and a Roth IRA. And we literally did roll her Roth IRA into uh, an annuity. She was like, I don't, I don't care. I do not want to have to worry about my money going anywhere. I don't want to have to check it. I don't want to be on the roller coaster. I I am done. I'm never going to put my money in the stock market again. Her parents have been doing that her whole life. And she has become, she has the oldest daughter, just like constantly taking care of them, right? Taking care of them trying to make something of herself and be a better manager of her money. And she's watched them go, through 2008 and not have anything, get to retirement age, not be able to retire. And she was just like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I don't want it. I'm not interested. Give me something else. You know, and so I always bring this up with people are like, can I get a, uh, an annuity? Isn't that like for old people? No, it's not. It's for people who don't want to put their money in the market and you don't trust the stock market. Like that's as simple as it is. Like, there's nothing else to it. Like it's a preference. Well, the biggest argument is why would I cap myself at, 12 and a half percent when the stock market went up 25 percent and you always go back of course you know past performance doesn't dictate future mm -hmm. um, but 2008 2019 all these years that we had huge crashes and it took you three five seven years to break even <clears throat> they don't see the break even point because they don't understand how fees work if you have a 25 percent return with a two percent fee you only had you know minus two percent so the FIA, as long as someone understands that it's a contract, as long as someone understands that there's a floor and there's a cap, there's a reason, like you said, there's a reason there's a cap because there's a floor. Mm -hmm. Like we're giving you all the upside. Why would we, or we're giving you the downside protection. Why would we give you all the upside? There's a reason for all these things. And if someone, like I have a client I'm meeting with tomorrow, we met 14 months ago and we talked about an IUL and he went with MPI because their illustrations looked ridiculous. Shit. And 14 months later, he's like, Hey, my wife did MPI. I didn't really care for it. I'm going to see what it does in the next two or three years and see if it implodes. Yeah. But I want to talk about my old 401k. 
So tomorrow we're going to talk about the 401k. There's there's new ways of thinking about things and people like hold back information like that even if someone says, well, I, I think I want a 401k and they really should get an IUL instead, uh, your, the CPA is not going to not going to offer this. They're just going to know you wanted a 401k. I'm going to give it to you because I'm a fiduciary. Oh, man. And you want to talk about CPAs? I've had so many arguments with CPAs in the last two years of most CPAs, they do everything they need to do to build the business. Once they get mm -hmm. enough business to where recurring revenue pays the bills, now everyone goes in this cookie cutter. At the end of the year, we'll do your taxes. If you're a business owner, we may do the Augusta. We may do this. We may do that. But for the most part, their job is to save you as much money now in taxes so if you go tell them, hey, I want to go do this IUL, no, keep doing your 401k match because it's going to drop you a tax bracket. It's going to drop you a tax bracket. If you're in the 24% tax bracket and you're pumping $22,500 into your 401k to drop 2% when taxes could double by 2035, nonsense. Nonsense. I mean, nonsense. I, I could ramble all day long as far as taxes go. but And most advisors aren't taught to do taxes because it's too complicated. They'll say, you're not a tax advisor. You're not a CPA. So don't worry about it. So then who's going to worry about it? <laughs> you're going to worry about it when you're 65 years old and take that first check. Yeah. And that's, that's the only time you're going to worry about it. I mean, what do you, what do you say to someone who's like, well, can I, how can I write off my insurance premiums? You can't write them off. That defeats the purpose. If you write off your premiums, the IRS is eventually going to catch on and they're going to say, Hey, your policy is not eligible for tax free income. You yeah. can't get the advantages on both sides, right? Now, I know there's some high level thinking strategies you can do to get your premiums written off, but it's not something that somebody who's paying 500 bucks a month is going to be eligible to do. As far as the tax write off goes, so the code is written specifically for you to pay taxes today. So if you're in a Roth IRA, the reason why you're in the Roth IRA is you're paying the taxes now to grow it tax free, pay taxes on the seed or the harvest. It's the simplest way to really talk about taxes as far as cash value life insurance goes. But yeah. the only way you can technically write off premiums and it state non-taxable is through a thing called CSD or capital split dollar. We'll talk about football. So the Wolverines, their head coach, he quit this year, but he had a capital split dollar plan. What that means is a bank is going to loan money, finance money into the policy, and you pay the interest only to the bank. So let's mm -hmm. say you put a million dollars a year in, the interest rate's 10%. You pay $100,000 that year to the bank in interest. So a million dollars went into your policy. You only had to pay 100000 So that interest you wrote off or you that you paid, you can write that off. That's the only way to write off premiums. And let's say five years down the road, they put in $5 million and we did some kind of hourly cash value. Now it's worth $5.5 million. You borrow from the policy the $5 million, You pay the bank off. Meanwhile, all you paid was $500,000 in interest. But your six, your 5.5 gets to compound. But a long story short, the only way to pay it off is if there's debt involved with it and you pay the debt. Yeah. If you pay it out of pocket and you write off one cent, your entire death benefit is taxable. If you mm -hmm. do a key person's policy at $500 a month and you write it all off that year, 6000 when that death benefit comes out of a million dollars, it's taxable. It's taxable as ordinary income. Whether you take it all as a, at a company level or you split it with a spouse, it's tax. Mm -hmm. Of course, people might argue, well, I don't care about the death benefit being tax-free. Yeah, but your kid might. <laughs> your wife might, <laughs> they're going to get taxed on, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars yeah. um, because you wanted to write off a measly six grand a year. The only way it also makes sense to make your death benefit taxable to modify endow endowment contract to make it mm -hmm. is let's say you're like 70 years old. You want to start mm -hmm. a policy. You have a million bucks and you're like, I can turn this million into two million in the next couple of years. Easily, if I just make it, the death benefit's worth $2 million. Well, if you can lifetime gift someone so many millions of dollars and it's tax-free, you take the policy, you make it, it passes on taxable, but they get to receive it as a step-up in basis. Now you doubled your money and there's no taxes. So that's really the only other way it makes sense to make your policy taxable. You know, actually, I met a guy who had a MECT policy, and the reason he had um, MECT is because somebody convinced him that would be better off um, using it as a vehicle to hide money, and he shouldn't really care about the limitations of it. Um, and the main purpose of mech it and putting the money there was because they had too many assets, and they were trying to qualify for their kids to get student loans and, and scholarships and grants, right? So they hid a bunch of their money in a MECT IUL. Um, and they're just like, well, we'd rather pay the taxes on the money than, than worry about losing it, have to put it in the stock market, have to 
have it count towards our net worth. Um, and so they had mech policies that he was taking money in and out, paying the taxes. And obviously he's paying a uh, pain penalties too, because he mech it. And you're not supposed to touch your cash value of a mech policy until you're 59 and a half. Right. And he was literally telling me it's been years now. And Casey, I'm, I'm saving money. He was viewing it in a different way, but that's more high level thinking of somebody who's wealthy. They're, they're considering you know how much money I just saved my kid and my family and everything else by getting them those grants? Then if I were to keep all my assets somewhere where, you know, the government would count them against me. Have you ever heard of that before? Yeah, but most of the time we deal with that with the irrevocable trusts. You could set up like a, a beat it, an islet, slat, just yeah. some kind of irrevocable trust. Put the money in there. Don't have the person as a trustee, whatever. Now it's all off their book. So you can do that. There's hundreds of different ways to do it cheaper and better. Very interesting. Very interesting. I mean, and we're, um, I'll, I'll cut us off here because we're going to talk about premium finance, trust, estate planning, all of this good stuff. So if this conversation is at all interesting to you, please stay tuned because in a couple of weeks, we will have a full episode dedicated to do everything you need to know as a high net wealth individual or as a business owner, as someone who is, you know, trying to think bigger. Right, we're gonna have an episode dedicated to that, um, and Wiley will be spilling all kinds of secrets unless he's got NDAs or or it's illegal. But you know this this episode um, of the podcast turned into turned into the Casey and Dustin show anyway. It's always a pleasure to to get to chat with you, my friend. Maybe we need to start doing more so a a Q and A on on live together. People like the social media. I'd love to do it on Instagram. I'd love to do it on yeah. other platforms because it's live live. I need to get to the point where it's just us two and maybe like one or two other people that I trust so we can have just a roundtable discussion on all this stuff. No, amazing. Amazing. We'll, we'll have to chat about this upline and, and get some things set up. But anyway, um, we will we'll cut it here. We'll save it for next time. Dustin, I look forward to, to having you having you back on the show. For anybody who is listening, thanks so much for joining us. Um, this has been the You're an Asset podcast where I'm your host, Casey the Dollar, and we find out who is an asset in the financial industry and who is Justin S. I'll see you next week. Bye. The You're an Asset podcast is not giving financial advice. We are not licensed financial advisors and our licensing is strictly in insurance products. The information that we talk about is specific to the products that we work with. We cannot guarantee that other agents will have the same product features that we discuss on the show.